you, John. Um, so yes, today I'm talking about harnessing renewable energy, but apart from the academic side of things, my biggest passion is ice hockey. And I couldn't come to Oxford and not show off this photo from last month, <laughs> where we, uh, we uh, managed to win the Patton Cup in Oxford for the first time in about a decade. But I have got the Australian flag on my shoulders, so there is something that unites us all. Um, so when we're talking about the future of electrical networks, we first need to understand the traditional network. So way, the way the network's been set up for the past 100 years has been large coal-fired power stations or large central power stations um, transmitting power at high voltages over very long distances through the transmission network. And finally, from load centres in cities, you have sub-transmission distribution networks, which takes it to the households. When we look at smart grids, this, this term that we keep hearing, it refers to a range of technologies, but broadly they can be classed as distributed generation and storage, which throws away this idea of unidirectional power flow and also increased telecommunication. So we get increased uh, visibility and control over the network. It's also important that we understand where the electricity comes from. So within the UK, just over half of electricity comes from sources which produce CO2 and just under 50% comes from clean sources, predominantly nuclear and renewables. Um, when we compare this to Australia, we see that over 85% of Australia's energy comes from carbon dioxide emitting sources, with less than one sixth being renewables. So even though we have such a great uh, renewable energy asset, we also have very cheap access uh, to coal. One piece of legislation which is going to change all of this uh, in the UK is this Climate Change Act of 2008. And what this is, this is the, first, uh, the world's first legally binding carbon emissions target. Um, where it has an 80% uh, reduction in carbon emissions by 2050 relative to 1990 levels. So in terms of how this actually looks and how the UK is progressing, uh, we can see up here that they, they, look like, they look like they're doing pretty well, but we should be cautiously optimistic because most of the progress so far has been the very low hanging fruit and the closer we get to that 2050 target, the harder it is to reduce those uh, last few percentage points of um, carbon emission. Now in terms of where these CO2 emissions actually come from, we can see here this is the uh, CO2 emitted in electricity generation. So that is the biggest contributor, followed closely by transport. So these two sources alone account for over 50% of the UK CO2 emissions. So any efforts to meet the 2050 target, the vast majority of those efforts need to be focused on, on those two parts. So uh, very um, strictly speaking, all the pathways looking to 2050 they completely decarbonize electricity generation. And the reason for that is it has flow on effects into other areas. So for example, a clean energy supply, electricity supply, means that if we use electric vehicles, we then decarbonize transport as well. And the same, same goes for heating. So my research uses solar photovoltaics and this graph here shows a relative contribution of different solar systems within the UK, depending on their size. So the bottom third are the less than four kilowatt systems which are residential systems, and the top 50% are the large multi-megawatt um, solar farms. Within the home, which is what I'm focused on, there are four key technologies that we assume are going to be uh, growingly present in the future. So one is solar photovoltaics, two is um, energy storage, three is electric vehicles, and the fourth is DC reticulation. So these four technologies all exist today, um, but they're treated as individual systems rather than a combined approach. So the first of these technologies, so solar photovoltaics, basically we use the sun to produce electricity and the electricity that's generated is in a DC form rather than an AC form. So when we need to connect to the grid or any of our traditional appliances which plug into the wall, we need to connect through a device called an inverter, which is what you see on the right, and then that allows you to connect, um, convert your solar power. In terms of energy storage, this is predominantly being used in off-grid applications, but the prices of batteries are constantly dropping. So we're seeing these uh, become more and more popular in grid connected applications as well, um, especially for managing the intermittency of solar generation. Again, batteries are DC, so we need, need some form of um, converter to convert that to AC. And likewise, in electric vehicles, um, these guys have batteries in them, which again are DC, but when we plug them into the wall to charge them up, that's an AC connection, so they would use an onboard rectifier to convert that to DC, but if you want to fast charge them, you need to plug them into an external rectifier which can feed DC into the, into the car. And the last part is all these appliances you see here and many more laptops, energy efficient lighting. These guys are all DC appliances. Uh, they all use DC uh, eventually. So these guys all have integrated AC to DC converters in them, um, which you are paying for. Um, 
So if we were to remove these AC-DC converters, we could, we could drive down the cost of these guys. So this graph here, or this diagram here, shows, I guess, the existing network. If you had all of these things in your house, so the brown box being your house, you could have these systems independently. They would each have an AC to DC converter, and all your appliances down the bottom would have an internal AC to DC converter. So you can see the sheer number of these converters, and these guys aren't very efficient. So what my proposition is, is to have a single, very efficient AC DC converter, and then have DC distributed throughout the house which means these other converters, these are where my PhD focuses, they're much more efficient. And down the bottom, you can see we've removed those converters out of every appliance, which can make them cheaper as well um, by feeding them DC directly. Now, some of the advantages, um, apart from the increased efficiency, because these guys can talk to each other, we can control where their power flows. So for example, if electricity is uh, very expensive on the grid, we can choose to uh, feed our solar generation to the grid rather than um, in the batteries. If it's expensive, uh, when we're using it, we might choose to consume from the batteries rather than from the network. Um, another big benefit is because we've got storage, if there's a blackout in the grid, so this is uh, mostly useful for weak grids, um, we can continue to have our home powered. And also in terms of electric vehicle charging, we're typically constrained by this connection to the grid because that's a very low power connection. But using our internal storage, we can fast charge our electric vehicles. Now in terms of the final application of our PhD, each of those converters would look something like what's on the right. So when I need to get to that, there's two stages to it. The first stage is designing a DC-DC converter topology, an example of which is in the top left. So that's an electrical circuit. And then also the code that needs, uh, you need to write for the algorithms, um, which is the bottom left, which is what controls all of those converters. Now, what does Australian leadership look like in this area? So there's two ways I want to approach this. The first is in the actual increase of uh, renewable energy in Australia. And that basically requires bold government policies um, at the, both the state and the federal level uh, because this is a maturing technology. It's not quite at economic price parity yet, so we need economic uh, subsidies um, to really increase um, the amount of distributed generation we see on the network. And from a technological point of view, most of the research in this area happens in Europe and North America. So again, more funding for places like CSIRO and universities would bring some of that R&D back to Australia.